Good evening, everybody. It's good to see everybody out tonight. Hope uh, everybody's had a good day, blessed day. Uh, has anybody got any updates or additions to our prayer list this evening? Let's look tonight to 1 Peter chapter 2. We'll look at verses 18 through 20. First Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse 18, it says, Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the forward. For this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. For what glory is it if, when you be buffeted for your faults, you shall take it patiently? But if when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. The Amplified Version says this, you, you who are household servants, be submissive to your masters with all proper respect, not only to those who are kind and considerate and reasonable, but also to those who are surly, overbearing, unjust, and crooked. For one is regarded favorably, is, or is approved, accepted, and thankworthy if, as in the sight of God, he endures the, endures the pain of unjust suffering. After all, what kind of glory is there in it if, when you do wrong and are punished for it, you take it patiently? But if you bear patiently with suffering, which results when you do right, and that is undeserved, it is acceptable and pleasing to God. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you tonight, Lord, for this opportunity to open your word once again. And Lord, I, I ask you to be with those, Lord, we mentioned for prayer this morning. Uh, especially, Lord, uh, be with our country. Lord, uh, you know, you see everything that's going on. And Lord, I, I just ask you to reach your hand down, Lord, and, and heal our land. And, Lord, as we look to your word tonight, Lord, open our hearts up to it. If there be one that's lost, save them before it's everlasting too late. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. A feller by the name of William Barclay points this out, that at the time that Peter was writing this, and Schofield has it dated as A.D. 60, there were, I don't know how he knows this, but he says that there were over 60 slaves in Rome at the time of Paul writing. And uh, the gospel was bound to reach some of these. The churches all over the empire were bound to be filled with slaves. And for this reason, he says, the New Testament has much to say to slaves. A fellow by the name of Francis Folks says this, in this day and time, the principles of this whole section can apply to not only to slaves and masters, but in this day and time to employees and employers in every age, whether in the home, in business, or in the state. So let's look back to verse number 18. As it says there, servants or slaves be subject to your masters with all fear. Or if we want to look at it like Mr. Folks suggested uh, employees be subject to your employers with all fear. God has given us a privilege to earn a livelihood, provide for ourselves and our family, to serve humanity through providing some needed product or service, to earn enough to help meet the desperate needs of the world and carry the gospel to the world. So he gives us here in these verses how we are supposed to behave, I guess I guess that'd be a good word, behave uh, each and every day of our lives. Not just on Sunday, on Wednesday night, but every day, 168 hours a week. One writer says this, a Christian workman knows that God is watching his diligence 
In other words, his careful and persistent work or effort is going to reward him for this. The heavenly work that is to be awarded is being determined by how faithful and how hardworking we are here on earth. J. Vernon McGee adds this. Many folk tell you, tell me, he said, how wonderful it is to work for a Christian boss. And if you have that opportunity or have had that opportunity, you know that, that's, that's pretty good. But what about the non-Christian boss? How, how are we supposed to treat them? We're to be subject to him as well, or her as well, as long as he's not asking us to do anything illegitimate or dishonest. And we'll go ahead and throw this in there with J. Vernon McGee's line, anything against God's word, that we're to be subject to them as well. What does be subject is? Well, J. Vernon McGee says it has the idea of freedom of choice. It is subjecting yourself, something you do voluntarily, not because you feel that your boss is a great person, but because of your testimony for Christ. Christians also reveal the praise of God by their attitudes and actions in labor relationships. One writer has this thought. In reality, being a slave or master has nothing to do with a person's commitment to life and work. Let me go over that again. Whether you are a slave or a master, whether you are an employee, an employee, or an employer, it has nothing to do with your commitment to life and work. The believing child of God, whether slave, master, employee, or employer, is to do the very best he can at whatever he's doing. We're going to get more to that here in just a minute. His state or condition or environment or circumstance has, is uh, to have nothing to do with faithfulness to his work. He is to do his very best no matter who or where he is. Now look at verse 19. It says, For this is thanksworthy if a man for conscience sake God, uh, toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. Now, a guy by the name of Alan Stebbs has this thought. Conscience is best understood in the sense of consciousness. The whole phrase, therefore, means prompted by a conscience awareness of God's presence and will. Such a man knows that God sees and knows what God expects. His concern is to do one thing, please God. For this is trustworthy. If a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. Now look at verse 20. For what glory is it? What glory is it? If when you be buffeted for your faults, you shall take it patiently. Now, buffeted has in it the idea, uh, according to J. Vernon McGee, to be struck with the fist. Now that there is pretty, pretty rough. This was often the treatment of those 60 million slaves in Peter's day. That if they did something contrary, they'd just get the tar beat out of them. If a slave would steal or lie, become rebellious, refuse to work, his master might take him, give him a real going over with his fist. Peter is saying that if you have been beaten for any such fault and you take it patiently, you have nothing to brag about because you've done wrong. Now, he, J. Vernon McGee talks about a businessman said came up to him and said, I've played the fool. He'd played the stock market, lost all his money, went bankrupt. And when I was talking to him, he said he was suffering for his own foolishness. To recognize his fault and take the subsequent suffering patiently did not commend him to God. 
But let's look at the second part of that verse. But if when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. Won't you turn over women to Romans chapter 12, verse number 19. Romans chapter 12, verse 19. We've read similar uh, verses in, I think, Hebrews chapter 10 recently. But the natural thing to do when we're wrong is to wrong them. But I'm going to remind you about what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. Do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. Do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. Sometime or another, we need to reach a state of maturity, like we talked about this morning, and realize this, that God's in charge, not us. He's in charge. And if you look at Romans 12 and verse 19, it says, Dearly beloved, or dearly beloved, avenge not yourself. but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. J. Vernon McGee saying getting back at somebody to strike back or get back at them was always his first reaction early on. But he said toward the later years of his life, he's learning to let God take care of it because he's going to do a much better job than he could ever do. I want you to look over with me to Matthew chapter 5, verse number 11 and 12. Matthew 5, verse 11 and 12. This is toward the end uh, uh, of the Beatitudes, or is at the end of the Beatitudes, but uh, Matthew 5, verses 11 and 12. Verse 11 says, Blessed are ye, or if you remember our definition for the word blessed, that we, we didn't, didn't bother giving it a while ago when we saw that word, happy to be envied are ye when men shall revile you. Now that, we, let's, let's get to the end of the verse first. And persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my Sake. Now notice what it's saying there. They do it for the Lord's sake. They do it for our testimony for the Lord. Happy are ye. Why? Because the idea in that verse is that we're doing the things that are right. There's a lot of folks in this world today, uh, been going on for years, that thinks that whatever you want to do, it's all right. That there ain't no such thing no more as right. There ain't no such thing as wrong. It's just in everybody's eyes, whatever they think. Well, God's words of a different opinion. There is still a right, and there still is a wrong. Verse number 12, Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. Exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. And since we're just so very close, turn over to Matthew 7, verse number 12. Why are we, why are we close? If we're an employee and... Uh, Let's look at it this way. We're going to do for that employer what we would expect our employees to do if we were the employer. 
we're going to treat them the same way. And if we are an employer, we're going to treat those employees just like we'd want to be treated if we were an employee. Therefore, all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do you even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. One group of commentators puts it this way. No person is going to be acceptable to God for doing wrong. No person is going to be acceptable to God for doing wrong. When Jesus was on the cross and he took my sin, he took your sin, he took the sin of the whole world upon him. The Bible says that God made him to be sin for us. I'm right there with the many, many commentators that when Jesus said these words, he, most everybody knows that he had about seven sayings on the cross. And when he said this, these words, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Most commentators, most all commentators believe that God at that point had turned his back on his son because he cannot stand to look at sin. Now, you say, well, what sin? Well, I want to re remind you one definition of sin. If you turn over to James chapter number 4, Verse number 17. James chapter 4, verse number 17. And uh, if I can remember it, if the Lord still has it on my mind when I get through reading this verse, I'm fixing to make some ladies angry. Is that all right, Jackie? James 4, and verse number 17. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Now, if you want to look at it this way, there's a line. Sin could be crossing that line that we ain't supposed to cross. Sin could also be not coming up to a line that we're supposed to come up to. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good, doeth it not, to him it is sin. A few weeks ago, maybe a couple months ago, I got uh, this thing from the University of Phoenix that told me how many students I had taught, how many classes I had taught with them, how many students I had taught. And that got me to thinking about how many students in a classroom, at a school, at an actual school, not, not, not online, but at an actual school, how many, and that'd be, that'd be a job and a half to count up how many that's been. I met up with one of my elementary school teachers one time, and she said that she had taught in her career between three and 4,000 students. And you think about those students having kids, and you think about how big of a thing that is, how many lives that she's still influencing. Because she not only influenced me, but she influenced Amy. Amy never had her, but because she influenced me, she influenced Amy. And because she influenced me, she influenced Anna and Jenna. And because Anna's a teacher, she's influencing, and it just keeps going. And then somebody chimed in and said, well, you had me in summer school. I hadn't even thought about the summer school students. Ladies, here it is. I had uh, this young man that he had taken every math there was to take. And they brought him to me during summer school and told me that he needed a half credit in something. 
And I said, well, this, this is the lowest math that I've got. And they said, well, put him in there. Give him the work. I said, okay. And I'd had him before in summer school. And got down to the end, and his average was like 58, 57, 58. And he needed his class to graduate. And I said, uh, you know, called him by name. I said, you know, the, the floor really does need sweeping. If you'd sweep that floor, I think I could find them points to bump you up to a 60. Here it goes, ladies. That's women's work. And I said, well, if you want to pass, you'll sweep that floor. And he looked at me, and the floor got swept. Don't know how many times I walked down the hallway and been over and picked up Piper. He said, well, that wasn't your job. But to keep something ringing in my mind, therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Picking up Piper off the yard. He said, well, that wasn't your job. Whose job was it? Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good, doeth it not, to him it is sin. Maybe some child saw me picking up that paper, and next time that paper might not be there because that child had done beat me to it. Do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. We are not going to be accepted if we do wrong. However, if we do well, if we do what's good, if we do what's right, this commentator, group of commentators say, he should be acceptable to God. Now, look over with me to Colossians Chapter number three. Colossians chapter number three. Verse number twenty three through twenty five. Verses twenty three through twenty five. And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. I've had people come to me and uh, get, we get to talking about this, that, and the other. And I uh, was told one time that on... Uh, a different job that this guy was on that they were told to quit working so hard because they was making all the rest of them look bad. I don't know that this happened, but I hope he kept working hard. Because whatever we do, do it heartily as to the Lord, not to men. What does heartily mean? means do it out of your soul. You say, I'm supposed to have an out-of-body experience? Mm -mm. No. From the deepest part of you, do your work. Whatever it is, whatever you're doing, do it with all you got. Now, I know this, being around different folks, realizing me, uh, I was told one day, and Marty, you, you have never been told you were fast at anything, have you? But I always try to do whatever I'm doing with all I've got. Sometimes I just don't have very much. There's others that go with something full steam 
And if you watch somebody doing that and somebody just going at it steady, they're going to probably finish about the same time. Whatever you do, do it with all your heart. The Christian workman's labor is to rise out of his soul from the innermost part of his being. So do it heartily. Verse 24, knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance. For you serve the Lord Christ. Ultimately, when we serve our employer, we treat them like they're supposed to be treated. Ultimately, we're serving the Lord in doing that. Verse 25. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done. And there is no respect of persons. If you look back with me to 1 Peter chapter number 2. Servants, or if you want to go there, employees, be subject to your masters. Be subject to your employers with all fear. Not only to the good and gentle, but also to the forward. For this is thankworthy. If a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully, for what glory is it if you're buffeted, or if you won't go this far, if you're corrected for your faults, you should take it patiently. But if when you do well and you suffer for it, you take it patiently. This is acceptable with God. So strive to do what's right. Somebody's been telling you this on a regular basis. The Lord puts folks in our path for a reason. I don't know how many times in life that uh, I've been thinking about somebody. Somebody just pop in my head and maybe I hadn't seen them in years. And all of a sudden, there they are. You say, well, that's coincidence. I don't believe in that. I believe the Lord it's Lord's doing. When we do good, we are honoring God. When we do wrong, we're dishonoring God. That plain, that simple. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him... It is sin. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, Lord, uh, for your many blessings. Thank you for uh, allowing us to be gathered tonight here in person and on Facebook as well. And, Lord, uh, you have your way in each one of our lives. Lord, help, help us to examine ourselves. Your word says that if we'd examine, if we'd judge ourselves, we'd be not judged. Help us to be doing the right things on the job, off the job, wherever we're at, whatever we're doing, to do the things that are pleasing in your sight. Treat our fellow man, whether it's our employer, whether it's our employee, the way that we want to be treated. Lord, uh, we give you all the honor, all the credit for everything you've done for us. And Lord, we thank you for doing all these things. We thank you most of all for Jesus that went to the cross and took our place. And Lord, you have your own way in each one of our lives. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, our Facebook family will bid you good night. And remember, I love you. Remember, the Lord loves you. And we'll be back Wednesday night at 7 o'clock.